What's up everybody? This is Chris from The Rewired Soul where we talk about the problem but focus on the solution. And if you're new to my channel, the whole reason my channel exists is to try to take what we see going on in the YouTube community or anything like that and try to see what we can pull from it and learn from to improve our own mental and emotional well-being. And that's why this video is a little bit different. I didn't do my whole intro and all that spiel stuff. Um, because we're gonna be talking about how they just found the body of Etika, all right? So this video is gonna be, I, I'm thinking, unedited. Um, I'm going to be looking at my phone because I wrote down some notes. But anyways, I'm making this video um, from a few different perspectives. Those of you who don't know me, I worked in the drug and alcohol treatment field for a little over three years. We also specialized in mental health. So I'm talking from that experience. I'm talking from the experience as somebody who has lost over 70 people to drug overdoses as well as suicide. And I'm talking to you as somebody who just celebrated seven years of sobriety on June 23rd. And seven years ago, I wanted to die, all right? So anybody watching this, like at the end of this video, I'm gonna share a little bit more and just talk about never losing hope. But if you're in a dark place right now, like please check out the description down below as well as the pinned comments. Um, there's gonna be some resources for help out there. If you are an international viewer, if you have the number for the suicide prevention hotline in your area, please leave it down in the comments. I'll try to update the, um, the description and update that because I mainly just know the United States one. But anyways, first I wanna share the story of Etika. So I, I didn't know who Etika was until April and that's when I started looking in the story. So Etika is, was a, a very big streamer, gamer, and I believe he had almost 800,000 plus maybe on YouTube and in October I believe it was, he sabotaged his channel. And he did this by uploading pornography and things like that just to break guidelines and tank his channel, right? Because YouTube, after three strikes, boom, they take it down. So real quick, like one of the signs of someone being suicidal is giving away like their most prized possessions. Like if you have somebody in your life who is giving away the things that mean the most to them, like this is a sign, all right? So when I... When I see that Etika gave away, you know, his YouTube channel, like that's his livelihood. That's his thing that he built, right? Well, I first found out about Etika, when was it? I, I believe it was in April, where he had a standoff with the police. And the reason this whole thing started was because people were worried about him. He was making suicidal threats. He was also acting very erratic. Um, he clearly struggled with mental illness. He had been, you know, in treatment before and things like that. Um, but anyways, he had a standoff with the police. The whole thing was live streamed. I made a video about it at the time. But anyways, like something I was just talking about in that stream is just, you know, just seeing people like egging him on and gassing him up and everything. Like this is just one of those things where people in the public spotlight struggling with mental illness. It's, it's very difficult. It's very scary, right? But anyways, Etika ended up, um, you know, getting detained by the police. He went to a mental health hospital and a lot of people are asking him, like, why'd they let him go? I'm gonna touch on that in a second. But anyways, he, he ended up getting out, coming back. He started a new YouTube channel and, you know, um, yeah, I, I just hope the best for him. And I'm like, you know, hopefully he's getting help. But the other day, I saw Etika was trending again on Twitter, and I'm like, oh no, this isn't good. And yeah, he ended up posting a video to his channel that YouTube ended up taking down, which was basically a, a goodbye. It was like a suicide note. And in the description, it was too. And yeah, I, a lot of people have asked me to make a video on it, but like many other people out there, I was holding out hope that this was, you know, just you know, him faking it or something like that. And more and more news started to come out. I believe the New York Post published something saying that, you know, um, they found his belongings on, I believe the Brooklyn Bridge, but there was still no body yet. And like, <clears throat> I'm just, you know, an optimist, like I'm holding out hope. But today the, the NYPD actually tweeted out and some other people are already covering it that they did find Etika's body, all right? So, yeah, this is so, it, it's, it's terrible anytime I hear about this because there's so many reasons, right? Like as somebody who felt that way for a very, very long time, like I just, I want everybody out there watching this to know like 
there is hope and you can get help. <clears throat> so a few things I wanna talk about, like something I saw, you know, Keemstar talking about when Etika went missing was, why didn't they hold him? Why didn't they hold him knowing that he was suicidal, making these suicidal threats, why didn't they hold him? And this is, this is just how the mental health system works. And you have to understand, like you have to understand like all the angles and everything like that and think about like what what can we do right like like let's say we even let's say it was even possible which it's not to hold somebody for a year two years three years whatever it is like they could still leave and just you know take their own life you know what i mean but legally they can't um but so typically what happens if you're making suicidal threats if you're a danger to yourself or others they will put you on a hold okay sometimes a 48 hour sometimes a 72 hour hold whatever it is and throughout that process i was just asking my beautiful girlfriend tristan about it she worked in a psychiatric hospital like typically what happens after those 72 hours is they assess you right are you still a danger are you still a risk so when we look at etica's situation he could have easily been like, you know, I was joking, you know, I'm a streamer, it was just for views or whatever it is. Like, people do this all the time, right? Like, think about, like, let's let's take another example. Think about a domestic violence call, right? And the police show up and then the husband and wife answer the door and the husband and wife say, no, everything was fine. Even though the neighbors and everybody heard the yelling and the screaming and whatever, and the police look around and there's no bruises, there's nothing broken, like, what can they do? So. It's very well possible that Etika, you know, told them that, no, this was, I'm not really thinking about taking my life just to get out of there. Like a lot of people do that just to get out of there. And if they were to talk to family or friends, or even if they researched Etika, they could probably find just even on social media or talking to friends or family members, and they might think that this is just something that he does. You know what I mean? So they can't necessarily hold him right and i i just hope people understand that like and you know when whenever a tragedy like this happens people want to point blame at somebody i can tell you i can i can tell you this like working in the drug and alcohol treatment center a story that happened many many times was somebody who was in treatment didn't want to be in treatment was forced to be in treatment, maybe by the judge or by their family or whoever it was, and they would start like bringing drugs in and getting high in the treatment center, putting everybody else's life at risk, right? And they'd have to get kicked out because they're not only endangering themselves, but they're bringing drugs into a treatment center, endangering everybody else. So they would get kicked out and then maybe that person would leave, overdose and die, and then everybody wanted to blame the treatment center. And it's like, I would have to explain to clients, like, what are you, what are you supposed to do, right? Like. And this is why mental health is so tricky. So speaking of um, Keemstar, Keemstar, you know, has been talked about a lot in conjunction with Etika because, you know, those, those two, you know, they had a relationship, like um, a French, I don't even know if it was friendship, it was business or whatever, but like uh, after the mental breakdown, like Keemstar jumped on the opportunity to interview Etika um, on Drama Alert. But anyways, a lot of people were on Twitter, like when Etika went missing, a lot of people were blaming Keemstar. And like, all I can say to that is like, don't be a dick, right? Like I am no fan of Keemstar, but to blame anybody for someone taking their own life is like just a really dick move. Um, not knowing Keemstar personally, I, I guarantee, you know, things like that have been on his mind. I guarantee there are many people on Twitter who joked about Etika and things like that like they have some form of guilt that they're dealing with. But here's the thing, and here's one of the reasons why it, like we can't try to blame people for things like this happening because something I learned about my own mental health is nobody can stop me from doing what I'm doing. Nobody can make me take my own life. Nobody can make me get drunk. Nobody can make me get high. But in the same respect, nobody can make me get better. Like that's, that's what I try to teach everybody who watches my videos. Like when it comes to our mental health, like there is just this massive personal responsibility. Like we have to do it. Nobody can get better for us. All right. So like when I look at this tragedy, when it comes to Etika, like, you know, when we're pointing fingers and we're blaming, like, unless he wanted to get better, like you can't force him to take his medications, right? 
if uh, if he was prescribed medications. You can't force him to. When I was first um, kind of watching the Etika story from back in April, like he left treatment. He didn't want to get help. When he was having to stand off with the police, he was like even telling them like, you know, you're just gonna send me back to a treatment center and they're gonna put me on these medications. You know, like you can't just hold somebody down for the rest of their life and force them medications. And that's why we have to wanna get help. But the other thing that I think is important as, uh, as somebody who's half African-American, I try to convey this as much as possible. Like African-American men and women are statistically less likely to get help for their mental health. And this for a wide range of reasons. This is maybe the, uh, you know, where they're from, where, the way they were brought up and things like that. Um, but just know, like if you're somebody who is African-American struggling with your mental health, just know there are specific um, resources out there. You can Google them and things like that. There are specific therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, and everything like that that work with African-Americans. So. Um, because I know just in speaking with, you know, other African Americans who don't want to get help for their mental health, they feel, and you know, it's true too. Like a lot of people in the mental health field are white and they feel like this person won't understand. Right. So just know that there are resources available. Um, the last thing I want to talk about again, like make sure you check down in the resources below because my story is seven years ago, I was laying in a hospital bed with a 10% chance of living and I, I wanted everybody to give up on me. Like everybody was begging me to quit drinking, quit using. They were reminding me that I had a son, you know, and all these other things. But in that dark place, my brain told me that everybody would be better off without me. My son would be better off without me. My mom would be better off without me. That's what, depression and suicidal thoughts like make you think, but it's also this hopelessness. And when I look at Etika's situation, I see this hopelessness, right? He, he, he sabotaged his channel, you know, and from there, it, like it, it wasn't being built back up, you know, he tried to, and you know what I mean? And like, I could just, I could tell you this, all right? As somebody who has lost everything multiple times, Okay, like never lose hope, like something that I'm just so grateful for. Like if any of you have been following my channel, like I've had a messed up year, you know, but I never lose hope. I don't know what it is. I was just talking to a friend about this in the Etika situation. Like, I don't know what happened or what it is, but I had this blind faith that I was given years ago that things will get better, right? And I wish I could just give that to people. And it's just, if you're struggling, the best advice I can give you is, first off, get help. Second off, if you can't afford help or don't have the resources for help, get a support group. But with all the you know suicide prevention hotlines, like there are people who are there to talk to you and to listen. But get a support group. It's important to people have, to, that you have people in your life who understand. Something that gave me hope was, like I hit, you know, quote unquote, rock bottom, right? But I heard stories from so many people who hit lower rock bottoms than I did. I heard stories from so many people, like I had a messed up childhood, but I heard stories of people who had even worse childhoods than I had. But all of these people like were able to turn their life around, right? And the thing is, again, like I mentioned, like we have to take responsibility for it. We can't just expect life to get better. You know what I mean? Like we have to put in the work. Sometimes that work is going into therapy. Sometimes that work is taking our medications. Sometimes that work is getting out of our comfort zone, going to support groups. It's 2019, like look on Facebook. There are plenty of support groups out there. Like whatever it is, go on Twitter, use the search function, type in depression, type in anxiety, type in whatever it is. You will find somebody who understands what you're going through. Because when we get into that dark place, we feel, all right, like we feel that nobody understands what we're going through, but that is a lie that our depression is telling us. There is always someone out there who understands what you've been going through. Like, I don't know if it would be beneficial, but like, I wish, I wish more people and it wasn't so stigmatized. I wish there was more people out there who, who would speak up and say, hey, listen, at some point in my life, I thought about taking my own life but I didn't. And here's why not ending it was the best thing that ever happened to me, right? Like, 
this is me seven years later and my life is amazing. It's not perfect. I still have challenges. I still have struggles. You know what I mean? But it is incredible compared to where I used to be seven years ago. It took time. It took patience. It took work. But my life is amazing today. And I'm nothing special. You could do the same. All right? But anyways, if you know anybody who might be struggling, like just be there for them. Listen to them. Talk to them. Uh, encourage them to get help. If you are the person watching this and you need help, do not be afraid to ask for help. There is always, always, always hope out there. All right? But anyways, that's all I got for this video. Um, you know, uh, God, I don't know. This has been messing with me ever since he went missing. And yeah, that's it. Check down in the description below. And uh, yeah, I'll see y'all next time.